Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. This is actually going to be a little more than just your standard reaction kind of filling in commentary and things like that. Uh, because with the release of the first two episodes of Masters of the Air, which if you have not seen, watch it. It's fantastic. It's really, really good. I watched the first two episodes right after they came out last night and uh, it was intense. So much so that I found myself like flinching when Flack would hit close to the plane. And there's a lot of action right off the bat. And uh, the actors are fantastic. I, I think you're going to really enjoy it if you check it out. So I uh, highly recommend it. And, and I know that I've got more of a personal emotional connection to this series than I might otherwise have. Uh, because my wife's grandfather, who is one of the greatest men I've ever known in my life, just a phenomenal human being. Uh, was a ball turret gunner on a B-17 in the 8th Air Force. He was in the 379th Bomb Group, who dropped more tonnage of bombs on Nazi Germany than any other bomb group in the 8th Air Force. And uh, uh, so uh, just from a personal family connection, we're very interested in this series. And so I thought it'd be interesting not only to talk a little bit about the history behind the 100th Bomb Group, which is the group that we're mainly focused on in Masters of the Air, but also to talk a little more about a B-17 crew, what the positions are and what their roles are. Talk a little bit about uh, the order of battle for, a, for the 8th Air Force. How are they broken down, squadrons and bomb groups and all these sorts of things, air wings? What does that all look like? Because you hear those terms mentioned in the series, but they're not necessarily explained really well. So... I thought we would dive into that in the midst of this video, which I haven't seen yet. It's from the Imperial War Museums, uh, and it's called Why This Bomb Group Are Getting Their Own TV Show. So I'm assuming it must be about the 100th Bomb Group. Haven't seen it, but we'll, we'll find some time here in the middle of it all to talk about those other things I just mentioned. Uh, so if you want to see this video in its entirety without my commentary or check out any of the other stuff on their YouTube channel, the link is down in the description. Also want to encourage you to check out the video that I posted about upcoming tours, uh, not only our overseas tours like Italy, uh, Germany and Austria and Egypt that are coming up, but also uh, the tour that I'm going to be leading in Vicksburg, uh, as well as some other meetup opportunities. There's a link in the description to that video as well. But let's go ahead and dive into this one. 1943. B-17s of the 100th Bomb Group went to war for the first time. The target was the heavily defended submarine pens at Bremen in Northwest Germany. And this is the the first mission that they show them on in the series too. It's in the first episode. It's pretty intense. And uh, it's kind of the introduction to battle for these guys. And, and you see kind of the confusion and the anger and the and the frustration and the fear and the, and the determination all wrapped up in one. This would not be a milk run. No. As the formation passed north of the Frisian Islands, Three B-17s became lost in the heavy cloud cover and fell prey to prowling Luftwaffe fighters. The 100th had been in the air for a matter of hours and had already lost 30 men. It was a So there's 10 men on each plane and there were three that get shot down. You see that in the series. And, and I should say up front, if you don't want spoilers about the series, probably shouldn't watch this video because um, I, I kind of know where the story is going. I've read the book Masters of the Air, which again is also fantastic and worth your time if you check it out. It's not only about the 100th, but it does focus pretty heavily on their story. Um, yeah, the, those those three guys get uh, planes get shot down. Nobody escapes from any of them. You see one of the things that shocked me that I hadn't really thought much about when you see it in the series is how fast the fighters come in. And even one of the guys in one of the waste guns is shooting at him. And he's saying, they're so fast. Like, like there's zoom and they're gone. You don't think about that too much. But when you got a B-17 flying over 100 miles an hour in this direction, and you got a fighter probably going 200 miles an hour in this direction, it's going to whip by pretty fast. The start of a legacy that would earn the bomb group the nickname, the Bloody Hundred. What we did has become legendary. My comrades mm. are the heroes. Those of us who did survive are just damn lucky. And that, again, and I know I'm pausing a lot here, but that's something over and over again you're hit with in the first two episodes, is how much these guys knew it was just luck. Who, who made it out and who didn't. They had lucky signs and, and things they would do. There's a guy who spills salt at the table before their mission, and so they tell him to throw the salt over his shoulder. Like There's all these rituals that they do, and they're all concerned about luck because uh, they knew every time you went up there, 
it was just the luck of the draw. What position your plane was in, whether or not the flak hit you or missed you. Ugh. Despite being one of the most famous US Army Air Force groups of the Second World War, the 100th was not statistically noteworthy. They won numerous awards, mm. but other groups won more. They didn't fly the most missions, drop the most bombs, or even suffer the most casualties. Right. So where did the legend of the bloody 100th come from? To find the answer, we have to go back to Army Air Base Headquarters in Kearney, Nebraska. It was here, in May 1943, that Special Order Number 103 was issued, directing the air crews of the 100th Bombardment Group to begin their journey to England. After seven months of training, the 100th would finally be joining the fight as part of the 8th Air Force. None of the 35 crews, totaling 350 men, could have known that only a handful of their group would make it through their required mm. 25 minutes. And these photos are fantastic. I, I spent last night after watching the two uh, videos uh, on fold3.com, which is a fantastic site for military records, going through the 885 photographs they have from the 379th Bomb Group, looking through every single photo, finding photos that have my wife's grandfather in it. And I did find a few in there. Uh, they're fascinating photos. And one thing you're struck by is how young these guys were. I mean, just like they were in the infantry or in any other branch of service, a lot of these guys were really, really young. Missions. By this time, the 8th Air Force had been waging a daylight bombing campaign on targets in occupied Europe for nine months and had paid a heavy price. Mm. The 8th's commander, General Ira Aker, believed that the only way to deliver the round-the-clock bombing campaign he'd promised Allied leaders was to drastically increase the 8th's fighting strength. The 100th was among an armada of bomber and fighter groups to arrive in England to bolster the flagging formations of the 8th. So they, they had to get there. But unlike infantry, who is going to go across on a troop ship, you have to fly your planes to uh, England, to all of these bases in uh, southern and central uh, England, especially on the east side where they would launch these um, sorties from. And pretty much every bomb group had their own air, fa air force base, and a lot of those are still there now, or the ruins of them are. My wife's uh, grandfather, his base was in Kim Bolton. Uh, and the base isn't there anymore, but the site of the base is still there, and there's some memorials there. We're hoping to get there one of these days. Um, but uh, let's. So they would uh, they would travel, and they would have to stop along the way. So Greenland, Iceland, these were places that they would stop on the way because they couldn't just take off from say New York and fly all the way to England in one go. Uh, they just didn't have that kind of range, um, and you see that in the series. But I want to talk a little bit. They've been talking about numbers and and formations and things like that. So let's take a look at the order of battle of the 8th Air Force at the time of the invasion of Normandy, just to see how it's all broken down. So like I said, this is the, the breakdown, uh, the order of battle uh, at the time of the Battle of Normandy. Uh, so June 6th to August 25th, 1944. Commander of the 8th Air Force at that point is Jimmy Doolittle, same guy from the Doolittle Raid on Japan. He's a lieutenant general at this point. Uh, and then you're broken up into uh, bomber divisions. Uh, and so if you want to try and loosely compare this in your mind, uh, a bombardment group would be kind of like your regiment. Your wing would be your brigade, and then you would be in a division. And each bomb group then had four squadrons within it. Uh, so when we're watching Masters of the Air and talking about the 100th Bomb Group, you often hear them refer to specific squadrons. And a couple of the majors, who are the main characters, Bucky Egan and Buck Clevin, uh, are in command of those squadrons. And the squadron could have six, eight, 12 planes in it. Uh, so uh, just for a perfect example, here's my wife's uh, grandfather's group, uh, 379th Bomb Group. Flying out of Kim Bolton Airfield, there's their commanding officer. They had four squadrons. He was in the 524th Squadron. Um, 41st Bombardment Wing of the 1st Bombardment Division. So that's kind of how they get broken down. And then each of your uh, B-17s within those squadrons then are going to have 10 men. And typically you're going to have probably four officers and then a number of enlisted men. And the enlisted men were typically sergeants. Um, they got paid more that way. A lot of the ground crew were going to be your privates and corporals and things like that. Uh, and you had officers on the ground as well. 
Um, but uh, somebody asked me yesterday about pay. You know, did they get hazard pay like, say, uh, paratroopers did? Uh, so the research I found is that basically if you were in a bombardment squadron or, you know, on a crew that was on active duty that was eligible to be called out for missions, you got a 50% increase in your base pay. So, for example, if you were making $120 a month as a sergeant, you'd be making $180 a month while on active duty in an air crew. Um, and there are some other caveats to that as well and other percentages that be increased based on certain things. But um, So let's talk about the crew for a minute. So you've got your, your uh, two pilots here, your pilot and your co-pilot. Um, and this is actually... Uh, this screenshot that we're looking at here is actually based on a study that was done by the 8th Air Force in 1944, trying to analyze where the casualties were happen happening in the crew and what was causing the casualties. And a lot of people think that, like the position where my uh, wife's grandpa was, the ball turret gunner, was the most dangerous. And it was actually not the case. It was actually one of the safer locations to be at on the plane, up underneath. It was, however, the most dangerous if your plane was shot down because you were least likely to actually be able to bail out. Because unlike the rest of the crew, you couldn't wear your parachute at your position and you needed to be let out and, and climb out and get, you know, and, and just it was dangerous in that point. So, um, so you have your tail gunner. Uh, down here in the back end, and all of these were they flew in formations, and so they had they were able to cover all of the areas of the sky. Uh, tail gunner in the back, and about seven percent of the killed and twelve percent of the wounded happened for the tail gunner. Uh, the waste gunners, those fifty cows in the middle, that was the most dangerous position on a plane, and you wouldn't think that logically in your mind, but it worked out that way. Nineteen percent. Uh, of the killed were among the waste gunners. One in five who were killed were waste gunners, um, and it was considered the most important, one of the most important defensive positions. Uh, but they often got in each other's way because they were back to back. Uh, radio operator uh, was kind of by himself in the middle of the plane there, and about seven percent of the killed were radio op operators. Um, belly turret, that's the ball turret gunner. Only six percent of the killed for the ball turret, but man, you had to. You had to be a small guy, which he was a small guy. Um, so then you have up front, you've got your upper turret gunner right here. Um, and he had the widest, widest field of fire, which makes sense. He's up on top. He can kind of see a lot. 9% uh, of the killed were there. 7% were the, was the pilot. And only 5.5% killed co-pilot. Uh, and then down in, below them and in front of them, you have the bombardier and the navigator. Uh, and the bombardier... Uh, they had that plexiglass nose, so there's no protection there at all. 16% of the killed were the bombardier. Uh, so next to the the waste gunners, that was the most dangerous position to have. Uh, and then the navigator, 11.1%. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of a sense. And by far the overwhelming cause of casualties was flak. And that flak, you, 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 watching the series, you get a sense of, of how scary and how deadly it was. Basically, it's just exploding shrapnel in the air that is meant to just send hot metal through your plane and into the, into the men and the crew. Uh, very few were killed from uh, gunfire, as you can see here, uh, which is pretty interesting that it was a pretty low number. Out of 1,117 battle casualties that were analyzed during that period, only... Seven killed and 37 wounded from 20 uh, millimeter rounds. Almost all of them, uh, the vast majority, were from flak bursts. These arrivals took up homes at newly constructed airfields in East Anglia. On the 9th of June, the 35 crews of the 100th landed at Station 139, named Thorpe Abbotts after the nearby village. This Norfolk base, surrounded by rural farmland, would be the departure and return point for the hundreds missions into occupied Europe that summer. All except one, Regensburg. Mm. This long distance mission into the heart of Germany would require the hundred to drop their bombs on Messerschmitt factories before heading south to North Africa. And the I believe this mission is going to be shown in episode three, at least the the previews make it look like next week's episode is going to be the Regensburg uh, Schweinfurt raid, uh, which, yeah, they did end up going down to Tunisia to land. Mission was part of a two-pronged raid, with the eighth strength split between the ball-bearing production plants at Schweinfurt 
and the factories of Regensburg. On the morning of the 17th of August, the 21 bombers of the 100th took their place as the last and lowest group in the formation. A dangerous place to yep. be. They weren't over and you any see that when, when they unveil the targets and they announce in their pre-flight planning who's going to be where. You see the groans from the guys who have the low position because they know how deadly it is. ...territory long Flat. before waves of Fokker Wolf 190s and Messerschmitt 109s wreaked havoc on the bomber stream, seemingly concentrating their fire on the planes of the 100th. The sky was strewn with disintegrating B-17s, enemy fighters and parachutes. This assault continued for an hour and a half until the 100th mm. finally reached the target. Dropping their bombs accurately on the factory complex, the battered B-17s made their way to North Africa. The 100th had lost nine aircraft, almost half the strength wow. that had taken off from Thorpe Abbott's. However, That's going to be an intense part of the show to watch is seeing them lose half their planes because we, we, what you see in the first mission is they lose three out of 19. Uh, and how devastating that is. Because you got to remember, every time you lose a plane, that's 10 guys. You know, w Band of Brothers, with the exception of D-Day, Easy Company never lost 10 guys in a day. And these guys, they're consistently losing, in this case, you're losing nine bombers. That's 90 men. Now, they weren't all killed. Many of them parachuted out, and they ended up as prisoners of war in places like Stalag Luft Three. But uh, a lot of them did get killed, and that's a massive change to go back and suddenly 90 guys aren't there that were there when you left. Wow. The worst was yet to come. Mm. Black Thursday. On the 10th of October, 1943, the crews of the 100th prepared for another mission deep into Germany. But their target wasn't factories, U-boat pens, or airfields. This time, they'd be dropping their bombs oh. on the center of the historic cathedral city of Münster and the railway workers who resided in it. As the 30 So, there's a lot that's been said about the deliberate targeting of civilians and the attitude at the time, and I'm not saying right or wrong, uh, because both sides were absolutely doing this, were absolutely targeting civilians. The attitude, the idea was that... If you destroy a factory, they can rebuild the factory. If you destroy the workers, it's a lot harder to train new workers and to replace those people. And in an, an era of an industrialized warfare where the economy of your nation and the factories and your ability to produce is what drives your military's ability to make war, an argument can be made that there is no such thing as a civilian in that case. And it's a harsh way to look at things and it sounds cruel now in an age where we have smart bombs and we try to do everything we can to avoid civilian targets. But that was the reality of the war. Fifteen aircraft of the 100th approached the Ruhr, they were met with a defending force of over 350 German fighters. Mm. Frank Murphy recalled, the fighters came on at tremendous closing speed with complete disregard for the curtain of defensive fire from our guns the leading edges of their wings twinkling and glittering as they fired. Exploding cannon shells walked through our formation. Mm. As the fortresses neared the target, anti-aircraft fire tore holes in the bombers. Flat guns provided Germany with a potent line of defense. When an 88 mm projectile exploded at altitude, it sent out jagged metal fragments that tore through nearby aircraft. It also left a characteristic black cloud hanging in the sky. And as we already mentioned, that was the main killer of these crews. This shrapnel was known as flak, and it could easily punch through the thin metal skin <sighs> of a B-17 and lodge itself in an unfortunate victim. Introduced in the spring of 1943, this AN-H-15 helmet was a standard lightweight helmet for the Army Air Forces. The original crews of the 100th Bomb Group would have worn helmets like this during their missions in the summer of 1943. And you see them wearing masks. Over 10,000 feet, they would have to wear masks. It's There's not enough oxygen up there for you to just breathe on your own. It's also super cold. If you've ever been on a flight going somewhere, you get up to 30,000, 40,000 feet, and you look at the, the information screen, and it tells you it's like 70 below outside. That's the reality. The helmet was fitted with earphones so that the crew could communicate with each other wherever they were on the bomber. They did this using a throat mic, which picked up the vibrations from the speaker's throat. Huh. However, this lightweight fabric obviously offers no protection against flak, and the bulky earphones meant that the conventional steel infantry helmets could not be worn over the flying helmets. That was until January 1943, 
when men of the 306 bomb group modified helmets to enable them to be worn directly over flying nice. helmets fitted with earphones. This local model Necessity is the mother of invention. Patient gained acceptance and was formally adopted as standard issue in early 1944 wow. and designated the M3. The M3 helmet permitted the flying helmet, goggles and oxygen mask to be worn with relative comfort and was painted with a coating of flocked paint of olive green colour that had the texture of velvet, enabling the helmet to be touched by bare skin at high altitude oh, without sticking okay. to the fingers. Because you actually see that in a scene, in, in, and again, spoiler alert, uh, on the first mission, the one guy takes his gloves off and touches the machine gun, and his hands stick to it, and he has to rip them off, and it rips the skin off because how cold it is up there. Skies over Munster. The flak-riddled planes of the 100th dropped their payloads and devastated the city centre. But the ordeal wasn't over yet. As they made their way home, the six remaining B-17s in the group were set upon by Luftwaffe fighters. Back at Thorpe Abbott's, the ground contingent anxiously awaited the return of their bombers. Of the 13 aircraft that took off that morning, only one reappeared in the sky. Royal Flush, piloted by Robert Rosie Rosenthal, had two engines out, a gaping hole in one wing, and three injured gunners. My goodness. Rosie, a Brooklyn lawyer, had performed a series of aggressive, evasive maneuvers to bring the crippled bomber back to base. Rosenthal would become one of the most famous members of the 100th Bomb Group, not only for his mastery of the air, but also for his dedication to flying combat missions. When asked why he kept on flying, he replied, everything I've done or hope to do is because I hate persecution. Mm. A human being has to look out for other human beings, or there's no civilization. Wow. By the 14th of October, exactly 109 days after their initiation into aerial warfare, 27 of the original 35 crews had been lost, and the bloody 100th legend... Think about that. 350 guys go over there, and nine months later, 80 of them are left? <sighs> ...had been born. For the rest of the war, replacement aircrew would groan when they found out that their destination was the 100th bomb group. But while there would be plenty of dark days ahead for the 100th, the concentration of losses never matched the slaughter of the first three months of operations. New leadership, improved discipline, and the introduction of longer range escorts improved survival rates. The 100th bomb group was also involved in one of the strangest incidents of the air war creating a double-decker B-17. Oh, yeah. In January 1945, Lieutenant Rojon of the 100th was piloting his B-17 through a fierce aerial battle when a thump resounded through the aircraft. To his horror, another 100th B-17 had collided with the bottom of his plane, its top turret becoming lodged in the belly of Rojon's B-17. Rojon and his co-pilot concentrated on steering the double-stacked aircraft towards land, giving time for both crews to bail out of the planes. Both survived the ordeal Crazy. unscathed and were taken as prisoners of war. They would be joining hundreds of their fellow bomb group aircrew languishing in German prisoner of war camps, many of whom had been there since the summer of 1943. Yeah, and some of them had been there even longer. Some of these guys were like, went all the way back to uh, Dunkirk in 1940. And if you've ever seen the movie The Great Escape, uh, that Stalag Luft III, that's where a lot of these guys were. These were these air crews that were held. Uh, in these uh, camps and a couple of the main characters from Masters of the Air if they don't say it on the video I won't give it away for you but a couple of the main characters are going to end up in Stalag Luft 3 as will some of the men of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, who were fighter pilots the Red Tails uh, who were flying missions in Italy ended up in that same prison camp and I believe they're going to be making an appearance later on like in episode 8 or 9 we're going to see some of that one man who evaded that fate was Robert Rosenthal. In total, Rosenthal flew 52 combat missions, wow. double his required yep. number, and was shot down twice, evading capture on both occasions. Still searching for justice, Rosenthal returned to Germany after the war to take part in the Nuremberg trials. Wow. For the personnel of the 100th Bomb Group, the war would end on a high note. On the 23rd of April, 1945, a convoy of lorries made their way through Norfolk's narrow lanes towards Thorpe Abbotts. But they were not carrying bombs. They were carrying food. Between the 1st and the 7th of May, B-17s of the 100th dropped supplies into occupied Holland. 
helping to relieve the starving population. Mm. The airmen could see the Dutch people waving on the streets as they passed overhead, some even spelling out thank you in tulips. Many veterans of what was codenamed the Chowhound missions described them as the most satisfying contribution to the war. During 22 months of combat, 732 airmen had been declared killed or missing in action. A further 923 had been taken prisoner and hundreds more had been wounded. These weren't the highest losses in the 8th Air Force. The 91st Bomb Group, which had been in combat almost a year more than the 100th, suffered the most casualties of any 8th Air Force Bomb Group. While the 100th had lost 12 aircraft at Munster and 15 over Berlin in March 44, the 445th Bomb Group lost 25 B-24s on one mission to Kassel, the highest single mission loss in 8th Air Force history. Wow. The legend of the bloody 100th was born not from the number of losses, as high as they were, but in the concentration of casualties over a handful of missions. the intensity of it and how short a time. At a time when airmen tried to find reason in the randomness of air combat, the idea that there were unlucky groups provided an explanation for the unfathomable losses. Yeah. But the longevity of the legend is thanks to the work of the 100th Bomb Group veterans and their descendants huh. who wear the nickname as a badge of honor. Yep. Even in today's US Air Force, the legacy lives on. The 100th Air Refueling Wing, based at Mildenhall in Suffolk, have inherited the name the Bloody 100th, ensuring that the losses of the war continue to be mm. remembered. That was great. That was really good. I hope you learned a few things along the way. I hope this helps a little bit to give some more context and depth uh, to you learning more through the series Masters of the Air. Definitely check it out if you get a chance. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.